You're listening to the First Baptist Rockdale Sunday Sermons Podcast. First Baptist Rockdale is a church dedicated to making disciples who make disciples. We hope you enjoy this week's message. We're in Romans chapter 14 today. If you have your Bible, you can open to Romans chapter 14. We're continuing to push through the book of Romans. We will finish the book of Romans Sometime before summer, I feel real confident. We're in the last three chapters here, so it shouldn't take me that many more months to get through the book of Romans. Um, But we're doing all of Romans chapter 14 today, which means you're going to need to get your listening ears on because there's going to be a lot that's going to take place uh, in these 23 verses. Sometimes I preach big, long passages like this, and sometimes I preach short passages. I give you 30 minutes no matter what, okay? So we're going to do our best uh, to, to, to do it all together. Don't put me on the stopwatch. You may be disappointed at the end of this. But Romans chapter 14, Paul has, uh, is instructing the Christians on how to live, how to uh, be united with one another. And we get uh, to this difficult passage in Romans chapter 14. I'm going to read the first half of the chapter. We'll stop and we'll, we'll break that down before we pick up the second half. So read with me Romans chapter 14, starting in verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one eat who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will uh, be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in the honor of the Lord. And the one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and of the living. So why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Guys, one of the interesting things about what God has done in the church is that he is working to make unity out of diversity. There is a diverse body that calls themselves Christians, and we are united under the lordship of Christ, and we are constantly supposed to be pressing towards unity, constantly pushing towards unity, because if we don't move towards unity, I promise you that our differences will press us towards division. The things that that, that we prefer will move us towards division. And the body of Christ is not meant to be divided. The body of Christ ultimately is meant to be united. We are supposed to be pressing towards one another. In Romans chapter 14, Paul acknowledges that inside of the church, there is a drift towards division over matters that are non-essential. And when those drifts occur over non-essential matters, we must take action. And so he begins in Romans chapter 14 with an example, an example that makes almost no sense to us today, that there are people in the church that will only eat vegetables, and there are people in the church who will eat anything set before them. Now, we're Baptists, we do potlucks, we eat anything set before us. And so we don't understand this vegetarian component of the Roman church. It makes no sense that there would be a division over what one eats or one doesn't eat. Like, you might prefer banana pudding, and I don't prefer banana pudding because I like neither bananas nor pudding, okay? So it's like the perfect storm of things that I I don't want to eat. But your opinion on that is, 
Well, good, more for me. I understand that that's your opinion on the banana pudding situation. No one is looking down on me. Now, some people may question my taste buds, but no one is actively looking down on me for my desire not to eat banana pudding. I use this as an example. Um, at my uh, first church that I was a youth minister at, went to an older church family. Uh, it was basically a senior adult church that had invested to build a youth ministry in the midst of their senior adult church. They ran a bus ministry. Our youth ministry would run, run between 20 and 50 kids, um, but it was basically all senior adults beyond that. It was a very interesting dynamic to work in as, as a youth minister at 22 years old like I was. And we went to one of these uh, ladies' houses. I had uh, two children at the time, Seth and Sierra. They were little. There was a shotgun leaning against the door of their house. Uh, and I'm like, like I, we, I'm like, kids, just <laughs> don't go near that. It was not a child safe home at all. The dinner was great, country cooking, love, everything they did. And they got to dessert. They brought out the banana pudding. Uh, and my mother taught me to be polite. And so I ate the banana pudding, even though I don't like bananas, and I don't like pudding. And so I, I kind of just suffered through the banana pudding. I was told that it was very good banana pudding by my wife. I believe her to tell me the truth, but it was absolutely banana pudding. And so I, I, we're talking, and I finished the pudding, and, and this sweet uh, uh, saint looks at me and says, Oh, you ate that so well. Let me get you another helping. <laughs> So, so I got a double dose of, 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 of banana pudding that day. When she offered thirds, I said, I'm good. Thank you so much. That was enough for me, right? But in the church, we, we don't understand looking down on people for what they eat. But, but in that context, there was a Jewish component inside of the Roman church. And because they were still trying to hold to eat kosher and they were trying to eat meat that wasn't sacrificed to idols, they did not trust that any meat that they could avail themselves of would have been butchered properly or that it would not have been offered in the worship of another god. And so they just wouldn't eat meat because they didn't know if that meat was, was, was going to meet the standards that, that, that it needed to meet. And so they wouldn't eat meat. And then the Romans, the, the, the Gentile believers in there, when the meat came in, you know, they'd be walking home from the butcher market with you know, 20 pounds of beef underneath their arms or whatever. Uh, and they gladly eat the meat. They had no problem with it because they weren't worried about upholding the Jewish dietary restrictions of, of, of how the butch animal was meant to be butchered. And because of this, it became a thing where it's like, well, you do this and we don't do this. And they began to side up over these issues. They began to side up over whether it was right to eat meat or not right to eat meat. And the one who eats the meat would look over at the one who's not eating meat and be like... They're so immature. They don't understand that Christ died for them to fulfill the law, and they don't have to uphold this. And they would feel this air of superiority because their freedom in Christ, which we are free in Christ, let them eat the meat. And then the Jewish believer, who Paul calls the weaker brother, would look over at the Roman and be like, oh, I can't believe they're doing that. Wicked, sinful people failing to uphold God's righteous commands and requirements. Both sides sat in judgment of the other side. And let me tell you, while we don't have this issue on eating meat, these issues exist in the church today. There are areas where we will cross our arms and we'll look across the room at someone else and say, I can't believe they do that. I, I just can't believe that they do it. There is no way that a faithful Christian would consume alcohol. There's just no way that they could do that. Well, that, that our non-teetotaler brother who sits on the other side of the room crosses their arms and looks at you and says, I can't understand why you don't recognize the freedom that Christ has given you to, 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 to consume alcohol. Uh, myself, just personally, so you know where I stand on alcohol usage, I don't drink. I don't have a, a, an issue with drinking. If you want to consume some alcohol in a responsible, non-drunken manner, I think that's, uh, uh, that, that's between you and you're a Lord. It's not good for job security for the Baptist preacher to go, go out drinking, okay? So I just don't do it. Um, I, I, I see no benefit for me in the way where God has called me to do. Um, but if you exercise that freedom in a way that doesn't violate the commands of Scripture, well, God bless you in that. We don't stand in judgment of that. But, you know, we, we do. <laughs> we look around and we say, I can't believe 
they do that. I remember I was early at this church. I hadn't been here too long, and I was at Walmart, and I ran into one of our deacons, and he had a ca- literally the only thing in his cart was a case of beer. And so you can't like hide it with other things, right? There's no like, this so I walk over, I'm like, hey, how you doing? And he's like, uh, my wife won. <laughs> Just threw his wife right under the bus. I mean, it was like immediate tossing her under the bus that she wanted, you know, some, I don't even know what it was, some beer. And I thought, you know, it's, it's fine, right? I don't stand in judgment over you. Just because I personally live under a different set of convictions in that area does not mean that you don't have the freedom to explore that. Guys, genuine believers, to pursue unity in the church, we recognize that we have no right to judge our fellow believers. We accept our fellow believers, genuinely accept them with their weaknesses, with their frailties, with the things that that we don't understand about them. We accept them where they are. doesn't mean that they're always going to be there. They may grow in their faith. They may develop more convictions or they may develop a better understanding of Christian liberty. But we, we accept them genuinely because we do not stand in the place of judgment. Right? They have a judge, right? They serve a master, the same master that we serve, and they will stand before their master, and they will rise or fall on his decree, not on yours. And so where you feel more restrictive, or where you feel there's no one who could possibly do this, you know, up up north, uh, back in the day, uh, if you were to light a cigarette, you were, you were you know, literally consuming the breath of Satan. And then down south, you know, deacons were smoking you know, packs of cigarettes out front of the church. Right? That was just, just culturally different. And sometimes we don't recognize a lot of what we claim to be biblical truth is cultural mandates that we've just adopted into the church. And one of the ways that we can be exposed to that is we can go worship with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ from different cultures. Whether that means going and worshiping with an African-American congregation or a Hispanic congregation, whether it means going across you know, international borders and going worship, worshiping with our brothers and sisters in Christ in, in Europe or in Asia or in South America, you realize very quickly, wow, like they do that, but we would never do that. Right? Like, I can't believe it. And there's things that we do that they're like, I can't believe it. I can't believe these women wear makeup like this to church. Oh my goodness, are they, are they women of the night? Why are they doing this? And you're like, no, it's just what we do. <laughs> it's cultural. There's cultural differences. We need to recognize that and that we are not the judges. There is a judge. Praise God, there's a judge. And it's not you. And so, so, so when you feel inside of yourself the desire to look over at your brother or sister in Christ and to go, tsk, tsk, tsk. Just, just pause for a moment and accept them where they are. They have a judge, they'll stand before them. It doesn't, you don't need to change your convictions, you don't need to stop doing what you're doing, you just need to stop looking down on your fellow believer or stop holding them to what God has convicted you to do. If you feel a strong conviction against alcohol, my, 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 my in-laws do, they feel a very strong conviction against alcohol. My conviction is slightly more practical, but um, they feel a strong conviction against it. Well, they, they can't stand in judgment. They should not, they can, but they should not stand in judgment against those who share a slightly different conviction. Guys, this, this, this idea of accepting people with differences is, is, is part of what Christ has done. He's accepted us. He's, he's allowed us into his family. We need, to, we need to genuinely accept our fellow believer, not to judge them. Acknowledge that genuine disagreements exist. They, they disagreed about what to do with the Sabbath. Some people held the Sabbath and, and, and honored that day and esteemed that day. That's what verses 5 and 6 are talking about. Others people treated it just like any other day. There are genuine disagreements that exist. Things that we were like, well, I don't understand how we can be on different sides of this issue. But they exist in the body of Christ. If it's not one of those essentials of the faith that hopefully we'll nail down on Tuesday night so we know exactly what those are for the men... Uh, in the room, but if it's not in the essentials of the faith, we can allow diversity, right? And non-essentials, diversity, and essentials, unity, and all things, charity. Where there's essentials, we must be united. We must be united in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we are lost in our sin outside of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
right? And non-essentials, whether it's okay to wear flip-flops or whether it's okay to wear makeup or whether it's okay to drink or to smoke or to gamble, right? Whatever it is that's a non-essential, we allow diversity inside the body of Christ. But in all areas, we, we behave charitably towards one another. We, we look at each other, not with a side eye, not with a way to, to, to get over on someone, but charitably trying to understand where they're from. Take a moment, have a conversation. I think sometimes we hold our brothers in Christ or our sisters in Christ as enemies because they, they're different than us. We're in political season, they vote different than us. I can't believe that someone would vote for X or Y. Well, I understand that you can't believe, I understand it. But I will tell you with absolute firm conviction that however you vote come November, that's when we have our big election, However you vote come November, there will be a brother or sister in Christ in this room and around the globe, around the country, the globe hopefully not, but around the country, who will vote differently than you. They just will. You say, well, that can't be. They, they can't possibly. It will be. It will be. So the reality of that should lead us to understand that there needs to be some charity in the way in which we have these conversations. Years ago, I had a guy who was very politically motivated, and he was using a, a pejorative, a, an insult to describe people who were on the Democrat side of, uh, of voting. And it wasn't just to the church, it was just generally, and it was out on Facebook, and it was public, and so I brought him into my office, and I said, hey, like, that's not a very charitable way to live. That's not the way in which we should talk about people, because, like, people who vote differently than you are not your enemies, just not enemies. And, and I mentioned a specific person who, who I knew in the body that we were in would vote differently than him. I said, you're calling this person that name. Would you walk up to them and say that to this nice, sweet woman? Would you, would you call her that? Well, no, no, I wouldn't. Well, then stop doing it, right? Be charitable. You don't have to understand why they prioritize the issues, how they prioritize them. Like, I, 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 I'm not their conscience. They will stand before their own judge. They will rise or fall with that judge. You're not him. So in all things charity, in essentials, unity, and non-essentials, we allow diversity in the body of Christ. It's what we do. It's who we are. We are all underneath the lordship of our king. As it says... Why do you pass judgment on your brother, verse 10, or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat, every single one of us. And verse 12, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. And so if, you, if you're doing things in a way that displeases your master, you will. You, your, your works will be passed before the bema seat of Christ. Your works will pass through the fire. What will remain will be those things that are good and true and honorable and pure. And maybe you're going to have some grief on that day, some things that you, you chose to do in, 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 in an understanding. But that's between you and your Lord. It's not, it's not between you and your fellow brother in Christ. Guys, we, we seek unity. We stand side by side with our brothers who drink. We stand brother, side by side by our brothers who abstain. We stand side by side with our brothers who vote X, and we stand by side by side by our brothers who vote Y. Why? Because we share a common Lord, and we hold him up as our king. Verse 13, so what do we do with this diversity? How do we live inside of this diversity with Christian freedom that you're talking about, preacher? Well, it says this, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide to never put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But if it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love um, by what you eat. Do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or of drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. 
Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating isn't from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So how do we live in a Christian community where we have diversity of opinions, diversity of, uh, 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 of outlooks on non-essential matters of the faith? How do we, how do, we do this? How do I, how do I behave around someone who, who has these struggles? Well, I actively seek to remove stumbling blocks from the weaker brother. The weaker brother in this case doesn't mean that they're, they're less biblically knowledgeable. It doesn't mean that they're uh, somehow weaker in all areas. It means in this specific area, they don't feel the liberty that someone else may feel in Christ. They're personally convicted that they don't have the freedom in Christ to do X or Y. And so for the drinking example, this would be the person who says, I, I, I abstain from drinking. I, I, I think drinking is a sin because, and they can get to all the reasons why. I don't know where the line is when, when inebriation takes place. I don't know when drunkenness begins. I don't want to be a part of that. I've, I've seen families get wrecked by alcohol. I've seen uh, countless people die on the side of the road due to alcohol. I have all these issues with it. And if that's the case, and, and you know that your brother in Christ has convictional problems with drinking, you do not consume alcohol around them. You don't put them in a position until they've acknowledged, like if they come to my point where it's like, I recognize that there's freedom in the Lord, I'm just not choosing to partake in that, but if it's an area where they don't, they struggle to see the other side of the issue, you don't drink in front of them. You say, well, preacher, that limits my freedom. Yes. <laughs> Yes, it does, because we live united with each other. We don't want to make them stumble. We don't want them to see you out drinking, or go out drinking with them, and then they'd be like, what do I do? How do I, how do I behave? I don't understand. We don't want to put a stumbling block in front of someone. Don't live so proud of your Christian liberty that you'll do whatever you want. Charles uh, Spurgeon uh, was, was a known cigar smoker. It's a big deal for him. You'll see pictures of him, big old cigar. He was a preacher in, in, in London years ago. Uh, super well-known. A lot of people had issues with his consumption of uh, tobacco through cigars. And uh, he says, well, I only smoke responsibly. And they said, what does that mean? He says, never more than two at a time. Right? <laughs> and so, like, like, Spurgeon was pretty outspoken in that. And it, was, it could be abrasive to people. There came a day one time when Spurgeon was older in his ministry and he was at the height of his fame. You know, his sermons, this was a different age. When he preached, they would take the transcript of his sermon and they would print it in the newspaper to be disseminated. He was at the height of his fame. He was one of the most well-known people in the world at this time. He walks by a cigar shop and they, on, on the sign outside they say, we sell the cigars that Charles Spurgeon smokes. He gave up smoking in that moment. He recognized that his freedom was beginning to, to create stumbling blocks that were going to be very public for other people to deal with. He just stopped smoking cigars. He said, I'm, I, I'm going to abstain. It's not that he felt like it was wrong, but he knew that that sort of publicity, people trading on his name to sell the craft, was going to create problems. And he said, I do not want to be a part of that anymore. As a Christian, as a mature Christian, we will limit our freedom, our Christian liberty at times, for the sake of someone else who's going to struggle. We call that being a good neighbor. Just looking around, and is what I'm doing going to cause you to stumble? For some reason, there came a point in Christian like world, pastors began to curse from the pulpit. Y'all may or may not be aware of this. About 20 years ago, um, several well-known pastors would use it, and it was like edgy, and like, well, there's nothing unclean, and like, it was very like, but it was very abrasive in your face. I mean, there's things that I've said from the pulpit where sometimes I walk away and I'm like, that wasn't the best for me, okay? So, like, I, I, I recognize it, but it was intentional, like, pressing people. And, and the idea was, like, I'm going to push this on people. I'm going to make them feel this. Well, like, that's, that's not an appropriate way as a Christian to live, 
right? It, it, you can say, like, well, it's just a word. I don't, like, your personal conviction on that, I think, is an area where there may even be some, some area for liberty, honestly. But if you're choosing to use it as the pastor of the church from the pulpit, you're, you're going to cause your brother to stumble. There's no place for that. There's no place for that. As, as Christians, guys, we, we, we do not let our liberty cause other people to stumble. Instead, we live as citizens of the kingdom of Christ, and we purposely try to build it up. At all chances, we seek to build up Christ's kingdom. And so we think, is what I'm doing, is what I'm saying, is how I'm behaving, is, are these things building up Christ's kingdom or not? And if it's not, well, then we put them aside, even if you feel total freedom to do it. If you feel total freedom to do it, if you are, have no conviction on you from the Holy Spirit, you know that the Lord has allowed you to do that. That's tremendous. But inside the context of the church, we, we will put our freedoms aside temporarily for the sake of others. That doesn't mean that you can't, you know, you know enjoy this freedom in, in, in another setting. But if you're in a setting where it's going to cause a brother to stumble, we choose not to do it because we seek to build up Christ's kingdom. We are citizens of Christ's kingdom. We seek to build that up at all things. But whatever we do, we do whatever we do with a clear conscience. Peer pressure is a weird thing, right? As kids, we tell, we, we get on to kids about peer pressure all the time. Get a special speaker come into the school, resist peer pressure, don't, don't give in to peer pressure. And then we get to be adults and people stop coming and telling us that and we get put in the same situations. I'm like, what do I do in this situation? Everyone at the table is doing this. Am I allowed to? Should, do, can I? Should I do this thing? If you have a conviction on your life to not do something, if God has purposefully laid it on your heart that, that for you to do X would be sin, well, doing X then becomes sin. Even, even if, you know, Zach can do it. I'm picking on Zach right now. Even if Zach has the freedom to do it, if I don't have the freedom, if in my spirit there's no freedom to do it, me doing that act, even though on its face, two different believers, <laughs> and he's held righteous by God, but because I have a conviction on my life, I will be judged because what I'm doing isn't from faith. It's from fear of others in the outside. You say, well, that doesn't seem right. That seems like moral relativism. It's okay for him. It's not okay for you. Well, there are absolutes out there. There are things that are wrong for everybody. The Bible is very clear on all sorts of sins that are not up for debate. <laughs> right? There's, there's absolute clarity on a lot of things. But on those areas where we just have convictions that are different, maybe we're in different places in our walk, or maybe the Lord has set you aside for a specific purpose in this area. To, to, to perform an act that's not sinful for another believer may indeed be sinful for you because anything that proceeds not from faith is sin. So don't give in to the crowd just because the preacher does it and the deacon does it and the Sunday school teacher does it. If the Lord has not allowed you to do it, you follow your Lord. Don't follow, I mean, in as far as I imitate Christ, imitate me. That's what Paul says. That's what I hope will be true of me. But do not let go of your convictions for other people. And it may put you in some weird places. I've been in some weird places before due to personal convictions. It's okay. For me to do would be sin. For you is not, and I accept that, and I just, okay. Do not allow your Christian liberty to be a stumbling block for your brother. Do live in liberty. Oh my goodness, Christ died to set us free. Live in liberty. Pursue the liberty that Christ has given you. But recognize that liberty is meant to be used inside of the, the family of God and the kingdom of God. And it can be damaging to your fellow believer if they're not where you are today. So, how do we apply this? One is we begin to recognize that your personal Morality is not necessarily God's ultimate morality. Just because you think it's right does not mean that God commands it to be right. And what's right for you in 
I mean, again, there is right and wrong in a lot of areas, so I don't want to become a, like, let's skirt around relativism as a whole. But in areas of conviction, you can, you can have a conviction and I can have a different conviction and we're still brothers and sisters in Christ. You don't hold them up as enemies. You don't, you don't try to convince them that they're wrong in all areas. If you have a relationship with them, you can have a conversation about it. Why don't you do this? Why don't you drink? Why do you drink? <laughs> okay. Why, why, why are you uh, using that crazy vape pen that they'll kick you out of high school for? Well, why aren't you using the vape pen? Right? Well, 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 right? Whatever it is, whatever your conviction. Why, why do you go to Las Vegas and gamble? Well, why don't you right? go to Las Vegas and gamble? Right? These are areas we can have differences on. But we don't exercise that freedom in a way that would harm the body of Christ. And your personal morality is not God's ultimate morality. God is not beholden to your judgment. God is not going to get to the judgment seat of Christ and then call you over and say, I need some help on this one. What did you say was right on this? What was your opinion on drinking? Because I got some judgment to give and I, I'm going to phone a friend here and you're the expert. You're not. You're not the judge and God does not need your help in judgment. So pursue unity Stop holding others to your personal moralities that are culturally in, informed and recognize that you have some of those in your life. The body of Christ is meant to be united. We should seek after unity. And one of the ways we do that is by recognizing there are differences and where those differences create conflict, we need to not live in liberty for the weaker brother among us. Let me pray.